Hello, welcome to module nine of a course called Coding for Crosswords. For more information on the course, please see the links below. In the last module, we learned how to read a library from a file. In this module, we're going to explore how to search that library for words. So let's take a look at where we left off last time. If we go to the source window, we will take a look through what we've done. There's include files that include the resources we need. There's this library class, which we defined, which holds all the words that we read from the file. And we also added the stats routines here. There's a routine called compute stats, which counts how many words of each length. It goes through the entire word in the library, which in our case is 12,000. And then it records the counts up to actually 17, from zero to 17 characters long. It records all those words. If the words are more than that, it does not record them. Then we print the stats here. We just loop over that counts array of the 18 entries, although we start from one. So that's just gonna be one through 17. And we print those counts out. Um, and then some other routines that it offers, the library class offers. You can get any word out of the library by the index number. So you give it a number from 0 to 11,999, and it returns you that word as a string. This is the original read from file. You give it a file name. In our case, this top 12,000. Um, if you haven't seen that, uh, please just see the previous module 8. It reads the file. It deals with a little bit of this DOS, uh, DOS Unix end of line problem. It pushes the words back. This is the key line um, right here that actually adds the new word to the library. So this will be called 12,000 times to add 12,000 words to the library. Uh, then it just prints out how many words were, were read here. It says that we read 12,000 words. And that's it for the library class. Then there's just the data. So we have the actual words themselves, which are a bunch of strings. And then we have this, this counts stat, which is a bunch of uh, ints. And those are both private, so there's no way that the people outside the library can see those directly. All they can do is call these functions up here. All they can do is call, you know, get word and uh, print stats and things like that. They cannot see these things directly. And that's important because it allows the library class to innovate on its own. So if somebody wants to change the library class later to implement a different way of storing these words, they can do that and nobody would even know. Nobody would... Uh, Nobody would have to change their code that calls the library class. And that's a really important um, abstraction, they call it, that you're separating the interface from the implementation of the library class. So we'll see that again and again, where it's very important to define very clean interfaces to things and then allow innovation, separate innovation within the implementation of things. And we've already taken advantage of that. If you, if you think about vector or string, these classes we've already used, we already take advantage of the fact that we don't even know how those are implemented. And in fact, different compilers that you use may implement them different ways, um, but we don't care. We, they just behave in a way that we uh, can understand and count on. And as long as that interface is maintained, uh, uh, we're fine. We can take advantage of any new innovations in those, those libraries. The next is this class grid. Uh, we developed that class back in uh, module six, if you want to review that, please go back there. This is the data structure. Let's jump to the bottom of it that where I put the, the data. This is a data structure that holds um, mostly this line. This is just a name just for an attribute, but this is the string of lines. And this is the actual, to remind ourselves of the problem we're trying to solve here, it's that dog cat uh, grid. That's the puzzle we're trying to complete. We're trying to construct a crossword puzzle that, that starts with those words and fills in all the other legal words out of that 12,000 library that will, that, will, um, that will intersect those words and create all valid words in that, in, the, in that crossword pattern that we've given it. All we have left is the main. Uh, we just declare the library and read it. And last time, since we're just working on the library, we, have, we just commented this grid part out. So we're still gonna work on the library for another module or two to just explore how to make that um, more efficient. There's one administrative task we have to do. If you go to the exec window here, let's take a look at the library itself that we're reading, this file that we created from Google. Now notice, these are all lowercase characters. It's important to note that 
from the computer's point of view, a lowercase t, for example, here, this t, is different than an uppercase t. Those are two completely different letters. They have different ASCII codes. So since we're going to be comparing strings with each other and seeing if they're equal, we really want to get everything to either lowercase or uppercase. And since crossword puzzles like to be printed out in uppercase, that's just the standard. If you go to any crossword puzzle in the newspaper, it's all uppercase letters in the answer key. Uh, we will just promote everything to uppercase. So we need to make a routine that converts all of these all of these um, words when they get read in, um, if they're lowercase, they should be converted to uppercase. So let's go to the browser and let's just see how to do that. Um, as always, I just like to search here. So you could say something like C++ lowercase to uppercase. That's just one example, but there's a whole bunch of these you can see. And here's a bunch of answers. Um, I like this C++.com, that's a really nice reference. So let's just go there and it shows you this routine called two upper. So it's a very simple routine. It takes one single character and it returns one single character and it's just called two upper. And we get that for free as part of one of the include files already. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's these guys there. We've already got them, so we don't need to add any more include files for that. So let's write a routine that will do that. So let's go and do it in the read library. So read from file. We're gonna do it while we're reading the library. And we are going to, let's actually, um, before we even do that, let's actually just go back to main and let's just test it here. Let's let's have a new word that's called string. Well, let's let's decide what we wanna call this. Let, let's call it, let's call our routine two upper that will take an entire string. And let's test it with, let's say, dog lowercase. Okay, what we wanna do is we wanna print that. So we want to print that thing and test it to see if it converts it to dog. So let's go to the top of the file and let's define that. And that's going to be string. So this will be the, the input string. Okay, this is going to be the first challenge. I want you to see if you can fill in the guts of this two upper routine. It takes a string as input and it returns as output the entire string that's converted. And I'll give you a hint in a second, but you can try it without a hint if you want right now. And the hint is that uh, we want some kind of loop, some kind of for loop, right? With something in here that will then somehow call the two upper routine with something in here, right? So this is kind of the skeleton code that you can use. If that helps you, see if you, that'll get you to do it. And then if not, let's, uh, you can just see how we do it together. Okay, so give that a try. And we're back and let's talk about what you did. So there's a, two ways to do this. I'll do it a couple ways just because you may have solved it um, in different ways. Here's one way. Let's make a new string. Let's call it S2, say it doesn't really matter. And let's loop over now all the characters C in S. Remember from last lectures, what this will do is it will, S is a collection of characters, just like a vector is a collection of things, a string is a collection of characters, and you can iterate over it with this for statement. So every character C in S, it's gonna run the thing inside. And let's do this. For, for the S2, let's push back something. Right, and we're gonna push back. Something we're gonna push back is two upper of what? Of C. Oops. That is pretty much it, except for we've promised that we're gonna return something here, right? We said this is gonna return a string. It's not modifying the string in place. It's taking that string, it's creating a new string, and it's gonna return that new string. So we need to return that. If you don't do this, it will complain um, that you have no return value. If you Declare that it returns string up here, but you don't have this return. The compiler will warn you and it will say um, you forgot to return something. And it's always good to get the compiler completely warning free. Don't ever run the program with the warning still showing because uh, likely you'll just be dying. You want to get all the warnings solved completely. There's really in this course and even in general life, there's really no reason not to fix every single warning that the compiler gives you. There's some very corner cases when you can turn off a warning when you really know what you're doing, but uh, you generally want to just fix 
all the compiler warnings. The G++ compiler is very good at that these days in um, giving you only warnings that matter. It used to give you a lot of warnings that you would ignore. Uh, those days are gone. So these days the compiler is really smart about the warnings it gives you. So listen to every single warning the compiler gives you and fix them. Okay, let's see if this will run. So we have the two upper call. Now, now don't, don't confuse that this one is this, this two upper with the capital letters. This one here is our routine that we've defined in this program. This one is the library routine that comes from the library. And that just takes a single character. Our routine takes a string. So those are, even though they look similar, they're very different routines. And we could have called this something, you know, foo, our own thing, but we're just gonna call it two upper. So let's run this and let's see if this prints dog in capital letters. Maybe we can add a little bit more here. We'll print just dog just to kind of give you the comparison. So let's go down here and let's run that thing. So again, we say G++ output a, a.c. Um, if that's new to you, please go back to the earlier modules. We do this all the time. We compile the program and we run it. And uh, first, of course, it prints, we didn't, we didn't comment this out, so it prints the library statistics. And then here we go, it prints dog lowercase and then dog uppercase. Okay, so that's good. So we've converted the dogs to uppercase. So now, last thing, and this will be another challenge. The last thing is to go back to the source window. And um, we want to, first of all, let's remove this little test case that we just did. That's fine, we, we know that works now. Um, and in real life, um, you know, if you're writing this code for any kind of real server, you'd want to leave that test case and make a test case that would guarantee that that code still works all the time, you know, for the lifetime of this code. In our case, we know it works once. That's good enough for our purposes just to keep going. And so we can remove that code. Um, where do we want to use that code? It's in this read from file, right? Every time we read a line in, anywhere in here, if the line's not empty, we can do it here is a good place. We can say line equals to upper line. That's pretty much it. Um, so um, I said that was a challenge, but um, it was easy enough that, uh, that there it is. And so let's check and see if that compiles and runs. And we don't really know, right? Because we didn't print anything out. So let's go back and add a word. Let's say lib get word. Remember this thing, we want to have to print an actual word out. So that gets the word, but let's print it out, right? So let's get that word, right? So let's print that, compile it again and run it. And now you see that this used to be thanks lowercase, now it's thanks uppercase. Okay, that was all just a little bit of a cleanup that we had to do to the library. So now we have a fully capital letter um, library, and we can tackle the main challenge in this module, which is to write a routine that will find any word in the library. So given any string, like dog or a junk string, have the library look and see if it has that word in the library. And so it's going to return a yes or a no, and that's called a bool. So let's prototype in the source code what we want. We want, we can get rid of this little test. We want to be able to say, see out um, lib dot, maybe we'll call it um, has word, okay. Does it have the word? Now we have to use capital letters, remember, because we changed everything to capital letters. So if we do lowercase, it will always say it doesn't have that word. So I have to say, does the library have the word dog? Has word. Maybe we want to say, just for grammar, maybe we want to say have word. Or how about is word, is word. So this is actually an interesting um, topic because you know naming, naming actually really does matter. When you write code for an interface, you really do want to sweat the name a little bit and sometimes you want to change names. Um, getting the name right um, uh, can really avoid confusion. You know, you can always add comments to the code to say, oh, this is what the routine's doing. But if you get the name, you know, really right, it will lead to much, um, much more reliable use of the library's code. So let's just for now, let's just call it is word. I think I, I like that. I like that uh, interface. So this is going to return a Boolean, true or false. So we're just going to check. Let's check a few words, right? Let's check maybe some junk stuff just to make sure that it returns um, nothing. And maybe let's check another longer word like um, what well, we know thanks was a word. Let's put that in there. OK, let's check those three, right? That's, that's our goal. So let's go back up to the library now and let's write that routine. So we're going to do something like this. It's gonna be bool is word. It's gonna take in a string. 
Now, is it going to be const or not? It should be const, right? Because we don't want to modify the library when we're just checking to see if it has a word. That'd be really buggy if when you just ask the library, do you have a word or not, if the library changed itself for that, like if it added a new word or changed one of the words it has. That would be very unexpected behavior. So you really want this query, like, in, you know, is word um, to be const. And that will force us everywhere, all the functions we call in here, everything we call in here is going to have to also be const. The compiler will guarantee that and it will throw an error if you try to call something in here, like, you know, suppose you call in here, read from file or something, it would, it would throw an error there. So what do we do? Uh, this is your, another challenge. Um, go ahead and write the guts in here and see if you can figure that out. What do you do to find if that string is in the library? Okay, give, give that a try and see if you, see if you think, and I'll give you a hint next. So stop if you don't want the hint. The hint is that Look at the print routine, right? Here's a print. I'm uh, sorry, not print stats. But let's look at the print of the actual, uh, uh, where's our print? Where's our print? Print stats. Um, oh, we don't have a print for the library. <laughs> yeah, that's a print for the grid. Aha, so that's okay. So um, let me see though. The stats is not bad. We can use this, this as a template. So the compute stats goes over all the words, right? It's looking at all the words. That's this line right here. And then it checks the word length of each of each word, and then it adds to this thing. So what we're going to do is something very similar, right? That's the hint. So if that, see if that gets you going, and stop the video if you uh, can go from there. Okay, we're back. Let's see how you did. We'll want to take the list of words here, and we're going to go over all the words in the library, and we're going to compare the word that we're checking for against each word. Right, so we have a little bit of a naming problem here. We can't call this S and this S. So we can call it T or something. I mean, you can come up with your own convention. People have different ideas about how they want to handle sometimes those name conflicts. Some people make very long names, like you could say, you know, incoming word to check. I mean, that'd be pretty crazy, right? But you could do that. Um, I tend to like smaller names. I think you don't lose a whole lot of clarity and actually kind of makes the code easier just to look at. If you get those long names, sometimes the code will just look more complicated than it really is. But you also don't want to have too many little short names. You know, if you've got if you've got three or four or five or six little short, you know, letters, then it starts to get confusing what the letters are. So you kind of have a balance there. In this case, we've got just the two strings. So really, it's it's pretty easy just to keep them separate. We're just going to say if s and then here we're doing an equals check if the s equals t so if dog equals dog or and if and if it's dog and cat this will be false if that's true what we're going to do is right away we can return true right we don't need to go through all the rest of the words so we're just saying if those two words are equal then return true and we're done and if you come all the way to the bottom what do you have to do you have to return false, right? Because the routine has to return something. And if it goes through all the words and it never finds a match, at the bottom it needs to return false. If you don't put this in, um, here I'll show you what happens. Let's go back to the execute window. It'll compile, it won't compile because it'll say control reaches end of non-void function. So this basically says, hey, you're, you said you're gonna return a bool. And a bool is a boolean, a true false value. And you didn't return one. So let's put that back in. Okay, so now it should compile. So that's fine. So now let's see if our program works to give us the answers we want. And here we go. It's giving us 101. So let's look back at what we were asking it. We were saying, hey, is dog a word? And it's saying one means yes, it's a Boolean. Is, is fuff a word? And the answer is no, zero. Is thanks a word? And the answer is yes. So there we've got it working. Okay, so now we have to talk about algorithmic complexity. All right, that's a big word, but it basically means how fast is this thing we just coded? There's a notation in computing that sounds kind of complicated, but it's not that bad. And it's called big O notation. So let's take a look here at that. Um, it's just called big, big O. And what it means is order of. Every algorithm has a complexity associated with it. And this algorithm is working over n words, right? There's, there's n words in our library. It goes all the way up. And this goes from 0 to 
12,000, right? And we measure it this way, well, zero to almost 12,000. So there's 12,000 words here. That's what our N is. The question is, what's the performance of our algorithm with respect to N? And here's three choices I'll give you, and you gotta pick one, this is a little mini quiz. Is it order one, meaning it always returns in constant time. It always takes the same amount of time to return you the answer. Or is it order N, if we had 100,000 words instead of 12,000 words, would it take you know, eight times as long to do the job? Does the time of the routine depend on the number of words in our library? Or is it, and this one's a bad one, N squared? You know, if you had 100 words in the library, maybe it would take um, you know, 10,000 units of time. But if you had 1,000 words in the library, maybe it would take a million. So which of those three, that's the little mini quiz, which of those three does this algorithm that we just coded fall under? So think about that for a second. And the answer is that it is order N, which isn't terrible, but it's not great either. Um, you know, it depends on the circumstance, but order N algorithms um, can work. Uh, and a lot of things are actually order N that you have to live with in real life. This is the one that's really terrible. The order N squared one will blow up on you and you really want to avoid algorithms like that. Um, that's when you're checking that's like the handshake algorithm. That's like if there's 100 people in the room, how many handshakes do you have to do? Well, everybody has to handshake with everybody else. So if you add more people, you, you actually take the square of the, number, of the amount of work because everybody has to handshake with, with that new person um, as well as the new person has to handshake with everybody else. So it's, um, those are the tough algorithms. But we're going to stick... Right now, we can take this order and algorithm and we can try to see if we can make it faster. Okay, let's look at what we're doing here. We've got this routine is word and it takes any word that you wanna give it and it checks to see if it's in your library. We have 12,000 words in the library. So for every word that we're checking, we, we go over every single word in our library and if it matches, we return true. And if it doesn't match any of them, we return false. So let's think about that in terms of a real world analogy. Let's suppose you have a library in your city and you want to see if they have a book and you bring the book into the library. So maybe here's the front desk of the library. And here you are with your book. And you're asking the librarian, do you have this book? Now the librarian has behind them this enormous shelf, right? Here they go, they got the shelf. And this shelf has in it 12,000 books. And the librarian says, I will check that book for you if we have it. And they take your book and they walk down that list and they compare that book with every one of those 12,000, okay? That's really slow, right? You wouldn't expect a librarian to do that. So what's, think of a way to make that faster. So let's think of the real world library case. Maybe they would ask you, hey, is your book fiction, nonfiction, science fiction, biography? Maybe they'd have five categories. So instead of 12,000 books in one shelf, they might have five shelves, right? Okay, so this is better. And they can just look at your book and they can tell right away what genre it is. If they can't tell that, then that's another problem. But let's suppose that's obvious. You're looking for a book about sports. So you want to go to the sports shelf. And the librarian can take that book and then can compare only now against, let's make, maybe, maybe, maybe there's six shelves. Make the math easy. So there's 2,000 books per shelf. So now the librarian has to compare with just 2,000 books. So that's six times better. It's still order N. Even though it's order N divided by six, um, if you had a billion books, it would still be kind of like order N. Now it's six times faster, but it doesn't really scale with the number of books. So that's still not a great way to do things, but it's better. Um, let's think of one more step better than that. Let's take the word of the title of the book, which you know, the person sitting here with the book, you can look at the book and you can say, what's the first letter of the title? And let's suppose they're all capital letters like we have here. There are going to be how many possibilities? 26, right? So. We're gonna code a version of that in our program here to show you how that's gonna work. And it's gonna take a little bit of time, but we'll, we'll go through it slowly and we'll show you how we can simulate the idea of having 26 bookshelves, each for one of the letters of the alphabet. We'll know which one of the 26 we have to look through. So we don't have to look through all 26, just one of the 26. Before we write the code that implements this idea of having 26 shelves, 
there's a part of the code I want to improve, and it has to do with right here. It has to do with this vector of string words. This is all part of the library class, right? I'm just flipping from the top to the bottom of the library class. In C++ and any language, you want to think about objects pretty carefully. So even though the word object is only right now a string, it's more convenient to think of that um, as an actual struct. So let's, let's make a new struct called word. That just feels better. The word is a kind of a concept. It happens to be a string, but it's really the concept of a word. And the more you get the data objects naming um, to line up with what they really are, the better off you are for adding things. For instance, we can put a string in here and we can just call the actual string also like lowercase word, or you can call it name, that'd be fine too. You could call it S, but sometimes initial single letter names are probably not that good for a struct. You want something a little more descriptive, I think, in the actual struct itself, as opposed to a temporary variable where you could use single letter names. But for instance, suppose we wanted to make the concept of a word have a point score, you know, so that you had uh, High, high value words and low value words. Like that'd be a great place to put that. We're not gonna do that yet, but the idea is that once you have this word struct, it lets you put more things together with the word and uh, treat that as an object that kind of makes sense at a higher level. So we're gonna have this word here and it's just gonna contain a string. And I'm also going to introduce the notion of a type def. A type def is a way to make a shorthand name for one of these complex types. Now, um, I will say this use is not universal. Uh, some people really don't like these. I tend to like them because they make the code, I think, more readable. Other people think they hide what the code is doing um, in a bad way. I think it's a good way to hide it, and I'll explain why. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a vector of words, well, a vector of word, right? And we're gonna, I'm gonna call it words. That's a convention I'm pretty used to. Um, there are a number of ways that, uh, a number of reasons why I like this. One is that it's it's a, Shorthand notation makes the code look a little tighter. The second is that I want to think of a group of words as really a bunch of words. I don't necessarily want to think of it as a vector. We'll learn later there's other types of sets of structures. There's lists, there's double-ended lists, there's um, different kinds of sets and maps and things. And words is a nice way to sort of say it's a collection of words and you can change then what type of collection it is later. Now again, this also uh, some people don't like this because it hides what you're really doing. You know, then you later on in the code, you'll see this words and it may not be clear exactly what that thing is. So I think whether you like this or don't like this depends on how you like to view the data, whether you like to see everything down to the, you know, down to the details, or if you like levels of abstraction that kind of uh, hide things for you. So I, this is my coding style and I'm going to use this and you'll just see kind of how it goes. You don't really have to use it if you want to inline the vector words in there. That's, that's fine too. And how we use it then is we go down to the bottom of library. Instead of a vector string of words, this just becomes words, words. Okay, so that's really the same thing now. Um, and um, we are going to also need to look at the uses of this word. So here we go. When we are iterating over words now, because we added this struct word, um, we don't just get the string, we get, a, we get a word object. So every time, for instance, here, this T, let's make it a W to make it more a little bit more obvious. The W now is really gonna be, um, is really gonna have a field called words. So as we iterate over the words, we get word objects back, and we have to compare the string coming in on the is word call to each of the actual strings in the word object. So let's do that one more time just so that you really get that. We've changed the words from being just a simple string to being this struct called word that includes a string. So when we iterate over words now, we don't get strings out. Oh, I did this wrong. So we don't get strings out, we get word out. We get, we get, we get, for every one of the words vector, we get a word out. For that word, we have to dig out the word, the string that's in it. So if this string equals the string that's in the word, that return true. So we have to make that type of change throughout this code now. So let's look at where the word is. So we'll do that same thing here, word w. And wherever we used s now, we have to say w dot word. Okay, let's keep going. Where else did we use words? Here, 
we have to actually this is okay so because since we're so, so taking the size of the words the fact that we're now having the words be a number of word objects instead of strings doesn't matter there's still a size that's still going to be 12,000 so that one uh, actually stays um, let's look at the next use of this now we're pushing back two words we're pushing back a line but we're no longer pushing back a line we're pushing back a word object and the word object looks like this we want to have a constructor for the word object that takes a string um, as as its input and let's we haven't written that yet so let's go back and write that so let's go back up to word and let's write a constructor that takes a string object right and assigns it so let's see if we're close let's go ahead and compile this there may be some that i've missed but we'll at least see how we're doing um and we indeed did miss one so line 52 is here and that is the get words oh yes so we're digging the word out of the array um that's the ith word out of the array but that's just going to be the word object so since we want to return a string still um, we're going to actually return the word itself um, so that should compile and run and let's also do one more thing back in the source window let's change the main function to not print the stats every time. I think we're past that. We don't need to do that anymore. That'll clean up the output a little bit. So here's the compile, which works okay. Now we'll run it, and there we go. We get reading 12,000 words, and then we get the, the, the dog is a word, that fuff is not a word, and that thanks is a word. Um, so that's this 101. So, so far, we've just kind of cleaned up the structure now. So now we have a little bit more of an object-oriented view of the words in the library with this with this word struct. Um, so that was just preparing for the next step. So th that will make the next step a little more clear, even though it's a little more text now. And you can see we're up to 135 lines. So our file is starting to grow now. Um, now we're going to try this thing where we put 26 shelves of books instead of one shelf of book uh, books. So let's try that so hang on there this is this may be the biggest module we've had yet in terms of the amount of code that i'm writing here so maybe it's good to stop and review some of that yourself and uh type some of that in and see if you get that to compile on your own um and then come back and join me here and we'll we'll keep going um, because i want to show you the power of of this idea of dividing this one big vector of words into this sublist. That's a very powerful idea, which will lead to the whole notion of a hash table, which is one of the key concepts in computer science. So let's keep going. Let's keep barreling ahead here. Um, what we're going to do is not only have one vector of words, we're going to have now, we're going to add, in addition to it, we're going to add... 26 of these right we want one per letter we decided we wanted to have an algorithm that puts the words not just in one shelf but in 26 shelves one for letter a words one for letter b words one for letter c words all the way up to z so what we're going to do is we're going to call that shelves so the first thing we have to do with this new idea of having 26 shelves is we have to make it 26 shelves and the easiest way to do that is to put that in the constructor then we're, then, then we're sure it always happens when we make a new library. So we make a new library. The constructor will always be called. And in that constructor, we're going to take our shelves, which always start empty. We don't want it empty. We want to resize this to 26 shelves, right? Because the idea is we're going to have one shelf per letter in the alphabet that the word starts with. Okay, so that's that part. Now, when we read the library here... We're reading these words. We're going to push the words back into this master list. We're going to keep the master list just to keep this uh, code easy. So we still have the one single list of all the words and we have the 26 shelves. So in, in, in addition to putting the word into the master word list, we're going to also put it into the shelves. So we have to, we have to say shelves, and this is the tricky part, and this is the whole key to the lecture really, which shelf do you pick? Um, you have 26 to pick from. And we're going to just defer that right now. We're going to make a function called bucket that's going to decide that. 
That's which bucket's gonna get assigned to. And we're gonna give it the actual string that we're trying to put into the shelves. And from that, it's gonna tell us what bucket to put it into. So we're gonna do this, if you follow this along. So we're putting one copy of the word into this master list. It always goes into this one single master list. And we're putting another copy of the word into one of the shelves. And which shelf is it gonna be? It's gonna be the shelf that this function returns. So let's go write that function. That is going to be a new function and it can be, um, it can be a member function or it can be actually out on its own. Let's leave it on its own for now. It's gonna be an int bucket and it takes a string as input, right? And it has to return which bucket to go into. So this is the challenge. Try to write this code. Can you see? It's a little tricky, but let's, 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 let's try to write it. I'll give you a hint in a second if you want a hint. Okay, so here's the hint. The bucket you want is gonna be numbered zero for A, up to 25 for Z. And you can use the idea that the ASCII codes you can start with A. So A should be zero. So you can take the ASCII code for the, for the first character of the string, you have to find that, and then you can subtract A. Okay, that is going to be the bucket that will be from zero to 25. If the first character of the string is always a letter, capital letter from A to Z. So if that's enough, give that hand a try and see if that's enough to get you going. And I'll see you in a minute. So welcome back. Here is one way to write this routine. You can say int i equals, and it's not c, we don't have a c, we have to pick, what's the, how, how do you find the first letter of a string? S zero, right? That's the first letter of a string, okay. Um, but this code is a little bit fragile, right? We should put an assert in here that string length Actually, we could say string empty. We can say string is not empty. That's good because otherwise this will core dump if it's an empty string. So you have to give an actual string to bucket function. You can't give it zero. And then this will return, that this, this S0 returns the ASCII value of that character. And if you subtract capital A from it, then A minus A will give you zero. B minus A will give you one. All the way up to Z minus A will give you 25. And that's what we want, a number from 25. And we should check that this really is a number from 20, one to 25, or zero to 25. So it's gotta be greater than or equal zero and I less than 26, right? That's the normal way to write those. So it's the lower bound and an upper bound. It's greater than or equal to the zero and less than the 26. Um, and then we return it, right? So we're returning um, a bucket that corresponds to the first character of the string's alphabetic you know, designation. So imagine your librarian again, and they take the book and it begins with the letter C, they're gonna put that in bucket, what? Bucket, bucket index two, right? It's the third bucket, bucket index two, zero, one, two. So we're getting close to compiling this and seeing if this will run. So that's that case. Um, Let's give it a try and see if I hit all the cases. And we did. So let's run that. And it got it. Okay. So it's a little hard to tell. Computers are so fast now. Running through 12,000 things is really is almost instantaneous. So you don't even see that we were only searching, you know, 12,000 divided by 26 things every time. Because when we did the call at the bottom here, these is word calls, right? We're now really, oh, no, <laughs> okay, now that's what we missed. So <laughs> we're actually still doing is word over the entire master list of words. We're not even using our bucket. So that, that was a mistake. So here we go. So the is word um, needs to be rewritten so that we're not gonna iterate over, over, over all the master list words. We're gonna iterate over one of the shelves. Shelves, and which shelf do we iterate over Let's make this a challenge. Can you find that? Why don't you write that code to find which shelf you want to iterate over? Because you, you don't want to go over the, the master shelf that has all the books in it, because that's too slow. You want to pick one of the 26 shelves that's much smaller. So how do you find it? It's going to be very 
Similar, in fact, the same as what we did when we were trying to add the word to a shelf. Now we're trying to find the word in the shelf. So what are you gonna put in here? So hopefully you come back and you tried that. It's gonna be, again, bucket, and it's gonna be given that. So that really is, that should be all you need because now you're iterating over all the words in one of the shelves rather than that big master list. And you do the same thing where you, see, where you say, is the string the person's looking for one of the words that you found in the shelf. Now that is gonna go 26 times faster because you've only got 126th on average of the books in, that, in this shelf as you did in that, in that master list of, of, of all the books. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this, compile it and run it and it gives us the same answer. So now we're really doing the, the, uh, the optimized search. So we're about, two thirds of the way towards generalized hash functions here. And the idea for the generalized hash function is you keep, you don't just pick something like 26 shelves, you keep making more and more shelves. But the trick is how do you scatter, reliably scatter your books or your things you're trying to put uh, across all those shelves so they don't get all lumped into one shelf with a, with a, with a bad hash function. Uh, so that thing is called the hash function, this thing we're calling bucket up here. Um, in general is called a hash function. And, and we're gonna try two more things in this lecture, so hang in there. Um, we're gonna try first making, instead of 26, we're gonna do, let's do 1,001 buckets, okay? So all the 26s we're gonna change to 1,001, and we'll fix up the code around it just a second. So we'll just, we should really put that as a constant. Const int, um, you know, you can do this different way. Num buckets equals 1001. Okay, so now we're gonna put here num buckets. And here we're gonna put num buckets. Um, we could also have put in here, we could have put um, shelves.size, right? That would have worked too. So now instead of this equation, we're no longer gonna look just at the first letter of the book. We need some kind of function that gets a chance of scattering all those words across a thousand buckets, right? So what's one idea to do? Well, here's one idea. You could take all the letters. Let's do car C and S, right? Okay. This is gonna iterate over all the letters and we can just add, we can do I plus equals. It's gonna add something to I, just like plus plus added one, plus equals added whatever you put on the right side. We're gonna add C. And then at the end, I might be growing pretty big, right? It might be more than a thousand. So let's say that the final bucket number, um, let's call it B, is going to be equal to I, and this is a modulus operator. So it's, it's a divide, um, but then it gets the remainder. So it, it'll always return something between zero and num bucket. Well, let's call it num buckets. Okay, so now it's gonna be B is the thing we're gonna return, right? So look at that code and see if I did it right. We're just changing the hash function now to be a little more powerful. We wanna give it more options, not just to look at the first letter, um, but to look at all the letters. And we kind of got rid of that minus A thing. We don't need I to be exactly zero when the first letter is A. We're just gonna let I be this like running total of all the letters. And it's gonna be this kind of garbage number. It's just this kind of, kind of random number of whatever the ASCII codes happen to be for all the letters in the word. We don't really care. We don't really have any meaning with that number. All we need it to be is stable so that for any string that we want to try to hash into our buckets, it gives the same answer all the time. And we need it to do a good job as possible of spreading all the words across those thousand buckets. We don't want one bucket to have all the words and all the other buckets to be empty. That would defeat the whole purpose of trying to shard this information across all those buckets. So this is just one of those general concepts in computer science of trying to take a lot of workload and smear it out evenly across a lot of resources like these buckets so that when we go to look for the words, you just have a very short list, maybe one or two or three words to find. In this case, we've got a thousand buckets, 12,000 words. So you would expect maybe if we did a good job hashing it, maybe 12 words per bucket, right? So instead of looking through 12,000 things every time you want to find a word, you just look through 12 things. So let's try to see how we did here. Um, first, let's see if we have need to change anything else. I think the way we've written this, the bucket code should 
have just generalized. So this is when we're checking for what bucket to go look in. That should still work. And then down here is when we are um, putting the word into the bucket originally, and that should still work. So by making the code modular, we also were able to do a neat thing. Even within the library class, we were able to change the hash function um, and change the number of buckets that we didn't really have to change much of the other code. So let's compile this and see, first of all, if I got it right. Um, and we did, and then let's run it, and it should give the same answer. But we want a little more debugging in there. We wanna make sure what we're doing is working. So what I wanna do is put a little debug here, just with some printing to the output. So when it's checking for the is the word, um, let's do something here. Let's print out bucket is, and let's actually print this bucket result, right? For word, and then let's print the, the, the letter, right? The actual word that we're asking for. So to see what, see what that does, that's just a print statement. We're not changing the function. We're just trying to get some insight into what these bucket values are for these words. And let's also, let's add a few more words just so we get a little more coverage. You know, let's just add cat. Uh, let's add some long word like, um, you know, confidence. I mean, I'm just making these up. Um, uh, stories. I'm assuming those are all in there. Well, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, let's go compile that and let's run it. And here's what we get. So it's reading the 12,000 words. That's great. That's always been the case. Now it's coming up with these bucket numbers. Now look at these bucket numbers. 218, 512, 457. Uh, those look pretty good, right? Those are kind of, you know, different. They're all different, which is good. Um, we don't really know yet for like a lot of words what the buckets will be. Um, but it's not bad. So there's a lot of concepts here. Let me slow down and try to give you a picture of what we're doing. Up top here, this is the bottom of the library class, and you can see the data that it has. One is this master list of words, which is the same list we had originally. Every single word of the 12,000 words gets put into this list. In addition, we've decided to put um, each word into one shelf of a thousand and one shelves. So there's a whole bunch of shelves. So let's look at that. Here's the words list. It's this one huge shelf, which we don't use for queries because it's too slow, but it's kind of nice to have around in case we want to find, you know, the 400th word, you know, we can find it easily in that list. This other thing we have is shelves. And it's gonna be actually a thousand shelves and they're gonna be different sizes. Now look at this. Um, because there's like a thousand and one of these we've said, and we're taking every book and distributing it randomly to one of these shelves, we may not get it right. There may be some of these shelves that are very small, in fact, even empty, and there may be some shelves that'd be very large um, if our hash function is bad. So what we wanna do is investigate the sizes of these. So a good way to do that is to add a debug function, and these often go at the bottom of the class so that you don't get in the way of the more commonly used functions. And it can look like this, for instance, void debug buckets maybe. And it's const, because we're not going to be modifying the library, we're just gonna be printing information about it. And for this function, let's do something that you normally wouldn't be looking at, a user wouldn't be looking at, but we're gonna loop over all the actual shelves, right? Um, and let's use the counting form of the for loop so that we can print the number of the shelf every time. So we're gonna say, Remember, it has three parts, the initialization condition, i equals zero, then the termination condition, i less than shelves size. So we're gonna stop at the total number of shelves, and then i plus plus. And then we're going to take the shelves i and do what with it? That's, that's each shelf. How about we print, maybe we print in square brackets, just to be nice, the, the, the number of the shelf. So that's the bucket number, that's the, that's the shelf that the, you know, the bucket will um, assign the word to. And then we'll put the closing bracket. And then we're gonna not just print the shelf, we're gonna print the size of the shelf, right? So that will print 1,001 lines, you know, one line for every, every bucket that has its shelf. And we'll print how many words got stuck into that bucket. So you see what we're doing? We're gonna try to print the full, um, the full distribution of those 12,000 words into those 1,001 buckets, and we're gonna see how good our hash function is. So now we have to call this function from down below, 
So let's go back to the main down here and let's call it like this. Um, right, we just call it like that. Okay, we're gonna still print these, these things, that's fine. Um, let's give that a try. And it does not, oh, ha, okay, this is a good little mini challenge. What did I forget? The above buckets is not a top level function. It only is a function of the library, right? So I forgot the lib. So that kind of stuff happens a lot. So let's compile that, it works. And let's run it. Now watch this, it'll produce a lot of stuff. So there it goes. It produces a thousand and one lines because it started at zero. And it's printing the number of words in each bucket. And it starts, look at this, it starts with very few. And then it's going to go, some of them, a lot of these have zero, which looks bad, right? That's not something we really want. And then, and then, and then here, look for it. There's a whole bunch right in this section. And then it kind of goes quiet. And there's a whole bunch in this section. Then it goes quiet. Then a whole bunch again. What that is, is because we're just adding the character values of the words. Those are all the words that happen to be like two letter words, three letter words, four letter words. So what needs to be improved, and this is the final thing. This is a lot of concepts in this module because uh, hash functions are, are, they become very obvious when you program a lot, but um, I realize that there, there are a lot to deal with when you're first learning them. Um, the last thing we're gonna do in this module is try to improve our hash function so that this gets more uniform, right? Because you can tell this, sometimes when it has to look for a word, it has to look through 29 words. Other times when it looks for a word, it has to look through, well, even 40, it has to look through zero. So it's not, it's not fatal, it doesn't prevent the program from working, but it's not very optimal in performance. It means that we're still not necessarily order one. We're trying to go from an order n complexity to an order one, a constant time complexity. Because if you keep increasing the number of buckets as your hash table grows, then you can keep the lookup time to constant time. So it's this really marvelous property where you will have any number of items, like a billion or trillion items, you can hash them and you can find any one item in that entire set uh, almost instantaneously with no, with no delay. So that's why hash functions are just a beautiful concept. But we're not there yet because look how uneven a hash function is. So let's go back and debug it. And that's the final thing. And this is the final challenge. It's a big challenge. How would you make that better? Just think of some random way. And there's a ton of ways. So there's a lot of theory. People do whole PhDs on this. How do you write something that takes an arbitrary string and scrambles it in a really interesting way to spread all those words out better over a thousand and one buckets or even a billion buckets. Um, go ahead and give that a try. Maybe even code one up for yourself and just run the same routine and see how you do. You can run it and see. And then uh, we'll see you in a second. Okay, welcome back. I hope you had some luck coding some better hash function. Hash function, this is very important. <laughs> Here's one common trick that's used, and I'll just code it and you can follow along here. You start with zero again, that's fine, as some sort of counter. You iterate over the characters in the string, that's fine, because you want to get something from each character. But as you go, you're going to add, you can say i equals, and you can take the, the i that's there already times some number. And since the numbers that we're adding are coming from ASCII, a good number to multiply them by might be something that, these prime numbers tend to work well for scattering things because they don't, that's why I picked 1,001 buckets instead of 1,000. Um, so we can pick another prime number, I'm not even sure if it's prime, but something like two, maybe 217 is, is an interesting number, maybe that's pretty good. So we're gonna take the original count times some kind of big prime number, and then we're gonna add the next character value to it. Um, you know, these hash functions are kind of funny. If you get something good enough, it's usually fine. Um, but for our purposes here, let's just give that one a try. And then we're gonna also do the same thing. We're gonna say the final bucket number, since this number here might, might grow quite large, in fact, it's most likely gonna always be bigger than 1001, we wanna basically divide it by 1001 and take the remainder. And that's what this operator does. It's a modulus operator. And then we get the remainder in here. So we're guaranteed that that this assert will always be okay. This line actually guarantees this assert will never fire, but it's not bad to leave it in there just for, just for safety in case this, this were to change. Um, let's give that a try. Let's see if our numbers down here, remember this is the window from last time. Remember how wildly uneven these were? Some of these were 50, 40. So let's run with our new hash function. First, let's see if it compiles, which it does. 
And let's run with our new hash function and see if it's any better. Oh, <laughs> that's actually very funny. <laughs> so the thing I claimed would never fire, but you should leave it in in case it fires, actually did just fire. This is something I didn't expect, uh, but it really shows you how you want to put the asserts in. And uh, I see now what I did wrong. Um, it's tricky and let's walk through it. Um, how you would debug this is um, you can just use a print statement right here. Um, and this is just a debug print statement. So you can just put anything in here. And what we want to do is just print out some of these things so that we know when the assert fires, um, what values cause the error. So let's just print out, you know, B, let's print out I, and we know that num buckets is always going to be uh, 1001. It's a constant, but still we can print it out just to, just to make sure. Okay, so let's add that code and then let's just rerun and we'll get an idea. And I have a suspicion, I know what it is. Um, and there it goes. And yeah, you can see what happened now. Okay, this is a tricky issue. It has to do with the fact that we made this number so big. So we started adding really big numbers here. We're multiplying times 217. If you get a long enough letter, long enough word, and you get a lot of high value letters like Z's and things that are way up there, this will grow so big that it will overflow the 31 bits of positive numbers that this can represent. So that's that can go up to 2 billion and then it wraps and it goes to negative. And when that goes negative, then this, what I said before wasn't true anymore. This integer B, the bucket number actually goes negative. And so this assert was really important that we put it in because um, you can see that the total went negative here. So there's a very easy fix to this, um, but this was a good example of, of debugging something live like this and seeing, making sure you always assert things are the way you think. Because even when you think, a lot of times it's not true and you're just really puzzled why did that possibly not happen that way. And then you realize, oh, there's some trick to the representation of the numbers like this where there's limited precision or there's something else you didn't consider. So it's just always, always good to put in these asserts even when they feel like they're overkill. They don't take very much CPU time at all. Don't worry about that. They save a lot of human time. Um, so let's go ahead and get rid of this. And let's go, there's a couple ways to fix this. Um, probably the easiest way is to just keep it in, and now nah, probably the best way is to, to change it to an unsigned. So you can do an unsigned int for i. That will keep i from overflowing. Now it can represent numbers from zero to four billion instead of minus two billion to positive two billion. Um, that's probably the best way to do it. Or we could, um, or another way to do it is to let it go, um, let it go crazy like this and let it go negative. And then just when, you, when you're done, just say i equals absolute value of i. That'll just take it, if it happens to be negative, it'll flip it to the positive and that'll work too. So either of those techniques is, is fine. Let's give that a compile and see if we run now. This time it runs and let's see, the whole point of this was to get a better distribution of numbers, right? So let's look at these numbers. They look pretty good. You know, there's still some that are eight, some fours, but overall this isn't bad. We can compare this to some of the built-in hash functions and see we're probably getting close. Like this looks pretty decent, you know, a little heavy in some areas. Um, but that's better than what we had before for sure. So that's the end of this module. Um, the, what we did in this module was to sort of build our own custom hash table. It's, it's not something that you'll do often. We're, and in the next lecture, we're going to just show how you can remove a bunch of this code with all this bucket stuff and just put in the standard C++ hash table. I just wanted to formulate that so that you had some intuition as to why those hash tables work so well. And it's because they're spreading the work out across lots of different buckets, right? That's the whole idea of a hash table. And you can see now the importance of the hash function. Um, and you can see the importance of having enough buckets that cover your data. So in the next module, we'll change this code to use the real STL uh, hash map, which is called an unordered map. Um, and we'll do that in the next module. So we'll see you there.